Yep, that was it. All right. Uh, happy Tuesday, everybody. I was just trying some new technology on my phone. Uh, didn't work. I didn't know how to do it. But anyways, I'm here. I hope you all had a good month. Uh, there has been a lot of fantastic surf. Uh, I always tell people, when they ask, they go, when's the best surf? And I say, without a doubt, January. January is our best month. And um, truth be told, I, there are so many insane days of blacks and the La Jolla reefs. And I mean, all over the world, the pictures and the videos coming in were insane. Um, can you sponsor me? Sure. <laughs> uh, what do we got here? Um, all kinds of questions from all kinds of people. Uh, uh, this is a good one. What are your thoughts on people changing, altering your designs, for example, stock dims or X, and they change them and make, you know, make it less wide or thin or Sarah, do you feel that's pretty much creating a new board, or do you think the original idea is still in there? Um, you know, first off, the volume chart is not gospel. It's just a guideline. And uh, I still get people, I have all these little um, short word documents that I because I have to answer the question so many times that I cut and paste into the, my response. But um, basically, it, it's, you know, for advanced, lighter surfers, uh, the volume chart's pretty good. It's pretty close. But then you have to be real about, you know, several things. Your, your weight, I get... A lot of guys, I get guys that weigh 240 pounds and they want to ride a, a 5'8", 24 liter board. And I tried to explain to them that, you know, the best guy, you know, one of the best surfers in the world weighs 190 pounds and he rides 31 and a half, 32 liters. And, uh, you know, every, every 10 pounds you, you go up in weight, you, you know, if you're young and you're in good shape, you know, I'd pump it up about a liter. So he's, you know, this guy's, you know, 50 pounds heavier than, than Wade. And, uh, you know, he wants a board two liters less. And I, you know, I try to be uh, polite and respectful. And I, I design the board that they want. But at the same time, I offer something up that's more realistic. And uh, you'd be surprised at how many people go, nah, I want the smaller version. So it, it really goes uh, with a big stigma. A lot of it's because of social media, but the smaller the board on your arm is, the cooler you look. Do you surf better? I don't know. <laughs> but, um, so that, for, yeah, first thing is the volume chart. And, uh, and then um, the dimensions. Those those dimensions on the website are dimensions that I, I put down as a, once again, as a baseline. And uh, you'll notice that it's, they're not, you know, the dimensions are listed at hundreds of an inch, which is kind of a, almost a mistake. You know, I get, you know, randomly, I might have a board that's 2.51 thick. And lately my mindset is, Oh fuck! I'll just round it off to two point five, and some people get really upset. And they go, "Are you you kidding? You you're upset about a hundredth of an inch? Do you realize, you know, how thin a hundredth of an inch is?" So people really get upset over details, details, and they don't seem to realize that I designed the board in the first place. And yes, there's room to tweak the design. You can, you know, I can make it wider, I can make it narrower, I can make it thinner and thicker, but within reason. If you like, I get guys that want to ride really short boards that are kind of heavy, and they, you know, they make a five eight three and a quarter inches thick, and I'm going, I can do it, 
but it will distort the design so much to a point where it's really not going to, it'll ride really shitty, but I can do it for if you want. My suggestion is to, you know, maybe go up a couple of inches, go out a quarter of an inch, and, uh, you know, maybe not three and a quarter, you know, maybe two and seven eighths or something. Um, but, um, yeah, the, you, you, I can, you know, a lot of times I can tell when somebody sends in an order that they took it straight off the stock model. And over time, um, you know, some of these designs are 10, 15, 20 years old. And over time, uh, the designs evolve a little bit. That's one reason why the dimensions are different. Um, and it's hard, I mean, we have thousands of SKUs, so it's impossible to keep up with it. We try, and uh, over time we get, you know, boards updated, but, um, uh, yeah, so that, you know, that, that's, a, that's one reason. Another reason is, is over time, really nothing really changes, but I might have had a board with maybe slightly thicker rails uh, when I did the when I did the masters, and now I'm doing slightly leaner rails, and um, you know, I can change the volume by a liter or two there too. So um, you know, one of my word docs is splitting hairs. It just it, it, you're. I mean, I hope you're getting a board from Rusty Surfboards because you 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 trust me. I you know, I've got some experience. Uh, I've shaped a few boards, and I, ho I hope you're uh, advocating to my experience. And, um, you know, you can put down the order of the ballpark that you want, and I'll, you know, I'll make you a board that's, uh, if, I, if I think your dims are correct or in the ballpark, then I'll run with them. If I don't, I'll, I'll do your board, but I'll offer maybe a second or even a third design, maybe it's sometimes a different model. Um, uh, you know, some uh, guys that want uh, boards with a low, low rock or a little bit wider nose and then they ask for like a yes thanks or something that's got a lot of rock or a narrow nose. Uh, I had a guy the other day that uh, loved, absolutely loved his SD, but he wanted to try the, uh, the um, keg. <laughs> he said, can I get a keg outline with a SD bottom and rail? And I go, sure. I mean, they're pretty close anyways. Um, but I, I did it. And then he started quibbling over uh, three or four tenths of a liter. And um, I, I'm, you know, I'm here to help you guys. I'm, I'm here to make the best boards possible for you. And, and, um, you know, another thing to consider too when you're getting a, a new board, uh, if you've been getting boards from me for a long time, we've got a relationship, I've got a long record of your boards, and I pretty much know, I have a good idea what, in what you know, at least within a range, what's going to work for you. Um, but uh, most often, you know, the customers are new, and I don't know how many boards, you know, I ask, but sometimes I get an answer, sometimes they don't. But how many, you know, how long have you been surfing? How good are you? And how often do you get to surf? Once a year, once a month, but I'm advanced. Um, just be honest with me. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me how good you are or if you're an absolute beginner. Um, my mission is to make you the best board possible. And um, so, I get I I get guys coming off of nine foot wave storms that want to try a six two, and um, I go, Sh you know, it's your it's your call. But once again, I do another word, uh, paste a couple other word documents on, like, uh, you know, you, sh you should step down in size slower. I my, you know, a foot works, but I think six inches is probably better. Uh, because there's certain things you'll learn just from riding a different board, just from coming off of a soft wet wave storm, or another shaper's board for that matter, if you've been riding somebody else's 9 know, 
and you want to try one of mine, and but you tell me the dimensions on this this other shape is I know and how the bottom is and what you want. It's only foam I can do it. But why 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 wouldn't you want to try one of my designs? So uh, that really happens, but that happens too. So um, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I, I, I understand a lot of your excitements. Maybe your first custom board, or maybe you've only had a couple, or maybe you've only surfed a couple of years and you're really excited about getting a new board. Um, but the bottom line is, I, ho I hope you, you know, I hope you come to us uh, uh, for, you know, for our more than anything, our, our quality and our design. Um, <clears throat> Is there a board that you don't like shaping anymore? Uh, that's a good question. I've never really thought of that, but I guess there, I guess there is. Like, um, uh, you know, some of the older boards you know, from from the '90s um, that had very narrow noses and tons of nose rocker and a fair bit of tail rocker. I I don't I don't like shaping them anymore I will but I, I don't like to because I believe we've improved the you know the certain designs and um, you know people people love the traveler and um, every now and then I still get a request for a traveler that board's 20 years old at least and uh, I said well how about the blackbird you know it's it's an update it'll handle everything their traveler handles and then more and uh, so, yeah, I, yeah, there's boards I don't like to shape anymore. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, I, I uh, you know, unless the board's so archaic, like I even go through some of my older models and I update them because the thought was good, the design was good. Well, no, the design, the, the design was okay, the thought was great. And over time, I've realized how to improve, you know, whether it's the rocker or the thickness floor or whatever. And so it's, uh, uh, hopefully I'm weeding out all the parts I don't like the shape, but I'm updating them. You know, some of them just go away, but others, uh, others I, I usually, I update, you know, fill out the nose just a little bit, relax the nose rocker a touch. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on your team writers trying other shapers' boards, then bringing what they learned like from other boards? Do you like that collaborative process? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't. You know, there's, there's, um, you know, if a team writer is discreet, you know, if he's surfing with a buddy, you know, uh, in a place that's not too crowded, and he, go, and he has a you know, he has a few waves on it, uh, and there's some things he likes about it. By all means, bring it in to me, share it with me. That's how we all grow. That's how we all learn. You know, as shapers, it's like you can't live in a bubble. And, uh, you know, I'm always learning. And uh, I don't know everything. I'm not even close. And um, there's a lot of good, talented young shapers out there. As there's so many great, experienced shapers out there. And now, um, especially with the computers, there's guys that are making pretty nice boards that are relatively new to the scene. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, but that's one thing. But if a guy gets a, if he gets a board from another shaper and it has a logo on it, and he rides it for a while, that's uh, that's a no-no. Most of them have in their contracts that they'll get spanked. <laughs> uh, uh, for new surfers, what do you recommend them most when deciding on a new board length or thickness? Or is it a combination of both balanced with their skill level? Um, 
You know, once again, that's a good question. You know, if you're, um, you know, it depends on your age, your body, you know, your body size, your body weight, how often you get to surf, uh, and uh, do you have a background in skating uh, or snowboarding? And, um, you know, a young guy, 140 pounds, and he lives at the beach, and he's a good snowboarder, a good skater, uh, you know, by all means, uh, I, you know, build you a, a fairly short board. Not your first board, but, you know, your first board needs to be pretty big because uh, everybody, everybody knows how hard surfing is. You know, the limited hours, it's good. You know, the wind and the tides. When you get out there, how many good surfers in the water? It's, it's, <laughs> it's where you sit in the pecking order is how many waves you get. And... Um, so forth. So if you have, if you're learning, if you have a board that's, you know, it, it, you know, in your first, when you paddle out, you all know that everyone's watching your first wave. If they've never seen you before, they watch your first wave and they assess your skill level. And it's really your first wave is your only chance. So if you, if you climb to your feet and you can barely turn, you're going to have a, a rough time with the crowd. Um, but if you have a big board and you catch the wave easier, you get to your feet a little bit sooner, the board's more stable, and you can turn it with more confidence. That's a good thing. Um, and so for the, uh, the, the older, you guys in their 50s that start surfing, you know, and I get a lot of guys that are over 200 pounds that want to come down in size. Uh, for them, uh, I'd say take it, you know, take it easy, like six inches at a time. And I started to go there a minute ago, but you, no two boards are the same. I mean, even the even boards for my pros that, you know, I take four uh, computer cuts off of one one uh, little drive. Um, same file, and the machine's got about a five percent tolerance. That means, the, you know, there'll be slight variations from board to board. Slight. You know, maybe a less experienced shaper wouldn't see them, but they're slight. And then everybody finishes the boards differently. I give those four boards to my four top shapers, and they're all going to come out a little bit different. And uh, so, you know, the top guys, because they've been riding the same boards over and over again, become very sensitive uh, to, you know, to the designs. But if you're, you know, if you're new or beginning or inter even intermediate, you, chances are you, you're ordering a board for me and you've never ridden anything like it. So don't, that, that's another reason to not quibble over details. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, I had a guy ordered a 610 utility longboard the other day. And uh, it was 610, but he ordered it 24 inches wide. So I made it for him, you know, squash and stuff. And then he emails me back. He goes, can, can I get a round tail? Uh, sure, easy. And I sent it to him and he approves it. And then about three hours later, he goes, well, how much nose rocker is it? Is in that board? <laughs> yeah, I felt like saying the appropriate amount, but I, I said, don't worry, trust me. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, yeah, but I'm kind of wandering. But back to the um, original thought or question, uh, you know, older guys, you know, you need to learn on bigger boards, wider boards. Width is really important. Younger guys, if you're coming off, you know, skating, uh, snowboarding program, you can go for a, a smaller board, but know that he who has the smallest board, smallest smallest board is not the coolest. You might think you're the coolest, but you know, when you learn to surf, you should probably learn a little bit of style too. You know, keep your arms under control, keep your legs a decent width apart, not too wide, but not too narrow. And you know, get get the fundamentals of style down too. If you if you're struggling to get up and stand on the board and you know, you're, you might not think you're spazzing out, but if you got to watch video of yourself, you might have a different opinion. So yeah, you, you, you younger guys, you smaller guys, yeah, you can 
you can go maybe not as short as somebody that's got a couple three years experience on you but you can you know you can go down I mean, but I always I always say what's you know surfing is about fun and if you're not catching waves you're not having fun you know you don't want to be a wave hog and have a big tank but um, if you have a big tank you, you got to have manners but if you you know if you just um, you know, you ride a little bit more board, you're going to catch more waves, you're going to evolve, your surfing's going to evolve faster, and it'll develop a sense of style. Uh, you think about the pro surfers out there, and, you know, some of them, John John, he's got, he's uh, Kyle Lenny, the, those guys are as rad as anybody. You know, they're crazy, they're on another level, because they have, a, you know, a skill set beyond belief, and they've got style. And that's a, one thing a lot of, uh, that's something that takes surfers a, a while. Some guys never get it, but um, it, uh, you know, it takes a while. And, and I think that's part of your development too, is one, your skill, basic skill set, and two, your style. Uh, okay. Can you talk a little bit about your use of e-poly and why you believe it is such a good material combination? Um, I mean, you, you, you could Google it. Epoxy is a much superior resin. In fact, glasses are stubborn, pig-headed guys. They want the easiest the easiest materials to work with possible, so they choose polyester, and uh, it's it's a little bit cheaper, and it's, the board is cheap, the entire board is cheaper because they're willing to do it for less than they are an epoxy board. Um, uh, the polyester sets up pretty quickly, especially if you put it in the curing chamber after you laminate it uh, and hot coat it, um, but it becomes brittle. And, you know, a lot of websites say lifespan is maybe six to eight months. You know, if, you know you've had boards, you know, poly, uh, polyester glass jobs, you've had them sitting around for 10 years, but if you use them on a regular basis, they will break down. The decks will crack and they'll They'll dent, uh, over time they'll dent severely and they'll they'll lose their life and their flex epoxy uh, it's it's not bulletproof but it's stronger and it's got better flex characteristics and when you first ride a, an epoxy board uh, EPS or torsion spring or um, in e-poly they'll they'll dent like uh you know, the boards, I don't know who's been, who's been around long enough, you know, some of you have some, you have but you remember um, SurfTech, which was like a precursor to Firewire. Uh, they made vacuum bag boards with, you know, uh, EPS foam and layers of high density uh, sheet foam and cloth and epoxy resin uh, in a vacuum bag. And those things were, they were indestructible. I mean, I, I made uh, several models with him. It, the timing was uh, pretty perfect, I guess you could say, because Clark Foam closed in December of uh, 2005, and then I had already started my project with SurfTech, uh, you know, six months before Clark Foam closed. But a month later, in January, at a trade show in Florida, we released our line with SurfTech, and everybody's going, ooh, a conspiracy. Unless you had something to do with Clark Foam closing. Uh, th that year, 2006, was huge for SurfTech. But people 
realize that an indestructible board isn't necessarily the best board. Um, he, I, I had, I built a model for myself, and I was writing it out at Cloudbreak. You know, and I could, you know, the rocker fit good. The board felt all right, but when I went to do a bottom turn, I, I could feel it wasn't bending at all. It wasn't giving one bit, and uh, and. Uh, you know, it took people. It took people about a year to figure that out. You know, Those people had the board. And some people still. I mean, some people come up to me and go, "I want this board reproduced." And uh, you know, guess what? It's a fifteen-year-old Surtec, and I, I'm kind of stunned because that kind of tells you the ability level. But um, you, you know, I draw an analogy. Actually, this is from Rick Hammond, my longtime shaper. Uh, he says, uh, you know, good surfboards are like a pair of shoes. You know, you get them. You fir yeah, first you wear them and they feel pretty darn good, but then you start to break them in, and they feel like they're a part of you. And then there comes to a point in time when you look down and you look at them and you go, I need to retire these things. They're pretty beat up. And uh, the same thing is true of the surfboard. It. It's, you know, it's got a dent a little bit. Uh, you know, some dent faster than others. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, we as surfboard builders have to have to always kind of find a balance, whether it's in the design, or the dimensions, or even the strength of the glass job. I had a guy order a 6'2 the other day that wanted a quarter inch stringer, and I go, why? And so it won't break. Um, you go, well, how about an eighth inch stringer and we can make your laps a little bit wider? How's that? And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, the, the, back to the epoxy resin. It's, you know, the polyurethane foam is um, it's pretty good. I, I, you know, I thought for a while when Clark Foam, the latter years of Clark Foam, is that their foam technology wasn't keeping up with some of the Brazilian and some of the Australian foam. And the guys would come back from, you know, uh, a tour event in one of those countries and I'd have one of my licensees build them a board and they, re they really liked the board. And I, I get think, well, maybe it's the foam. But in reality, you know, it's like, uh, you, you know, U.S. blank, Spolidium foam is pretty good, but there's a lot of foam companies out there. And, uh, you know, but for the most part, um, uh, you know, we have one one company that we're more happier with, <laughs> the foam. Uh, and so the, with the, with the epoxy glassing, you you get a board that'll it will dent, uh, but it it will hold up longer. It'll have a better flex for a longer time, and I think. Uh, I think the glass jobs come out a little bit lighter uh, because polyester, you have a limited work time. You you put the catalyst in, and depending how hot the room is, I mean, if the room's 80 degrees, you better you better hustle because the, the resin's going to kick off pretty quick. So you got to use a bigger bucket of resin. You got to work quicker, and there's a really fine line between taking too much resin out and not leaving enough in. You know, so some ways I think it's harder to do a polyester glass job. Um, the, the epoxy, on the other hand, it's temperature sensitive too, but it, it, it's got a longer half-life. It takes um, a little bit longer for it to kick. Uh, even if you put more catalyst in, it really doesn't speed up the kick time a whole bunch. Uh, uh, so the laminar has a longer time. You can work the resin into the into the uh, into the cloth and into the foam and get a good connection and have it fill just the right amount, and that's why I argue that you know the board's not significant. But if you're worried about a half a liter, which is like two percent or three percent of the board, uh, you know a half pound on a six pound board, that's. 12-15% difference and people forget about weight of surfboards these days because it's so fixated on volume but um, you know 
I'll seg segue me back into the discussion of volume, but uh, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, my thoughts. Yeah. So yeah, and in epoxy and EPS, it's a different type of foam. It's beaded foam. The polyurethane foam is a cell. Is a is a is a starts with a big bat of liquid. And it gets put into a mold and it expands, and so all the cells are interconnected. Uh, the EPS is small individual beads that uh, get put into a mold that it gets heated, and the beads expand. And depending on the size of the mold, like uh, you know, it wasn't until recent years that uh, foam makers made actual foam surfboard foam uh, molds. For EPS, uh, where you know the, the mold is, you know, maybe a half inch thicker than the finished product instead of five inches thicker, <laughs> because EPS for years was just cut out of block foam, cheap block foam, and you, you know, you the bigger the mold, the harder it is to get proper compression. So with a surfboard size mold. Uh, you know, we're getting very good compression, very tight seals between those balls as they expand. Uh, the more pressure it's under, the better the better they are connected to each other, and the more impervious that foam is to water, uh, water flowing through it. Like um, we, uh, the early, early days of EPS, the you know, you get a ding, and I. I'd say you gotta get all the water right away because the board will fill up with water pretty quick. Uh, now it's a little bit better. Um, yeah, so in a nutshell, I think epoxy, you just look it up, just Google it. Epoxy is a far superior resin and it really doesn't cost that much more. The material doesn't, but the, uh, the craftsmen charge a bit more. To, it takes a lot, bit longer, and and I believe the you know if I had two guys and I was going to teach them how to glass polyester, and I was going to teach them how to glass epoxy, I think uh, you know from a from a scratch standpoint, the guy would probably pick up the epoxy glassing quicker. Um, When you're designing a new board, is there a process you follow when thinking through that design? Maybe you could describe the process that you went through with the uh, new keg model and how that would be applicable or not to someone that serves differently. I know that it is really difficult to take a specific element of the design out of context or out of the whole, but how do you think about the real design and the template as an example? Uh, well, the keg's a good one because um, you know Wade. Wade, uh, you know he'd been in a long-term relationship with another another shaper, and uh, his boards were working, you know, pretty good for him. And so he he had specific ideas. Um, you know, he, he it's, when you're an advanced surfer, it's uh, you know you become very sensitive to small changes. Um, so we had to, we had to um, kind of work work with uh, his previous shapers' designs, and we'd build him some test boards. We give them for him to try, and he go, "Oh, they work good, but <laughs> it's the butt board again." But uh, and it took a few rounds, but. Uh, and there were three of us working on it. There's myself, uh, Ado, our Australian shaper, and Pedro, my the guy in charge here in the U.S. Uh, Pedro, guy here in charge for U.S. He's actually uh, he's been with me for 35 years and great, uh, great shaper, uh, great surfer. And, uh, he's originally uh, running a Brazil business, but he's he's been here for uh, about 15 years. Anyways, the three of us, you know, combined efforts on the board, and um, what we came up with was uh, a board of five eleven with incredible amount of rocker. I mean, more than I'd seen since the early nineties. 
uh, especially in the nose, like uh, five and three eighths, five, almost five and a half inches in the tip, uh, and then 2.4 in the tail, and pretty, pretty significant numbers of foot in. And uh, the other thing was is the depth of the concave. He had a pretty deep single. Um, that started well ahead of center and fed into the center and the deepest part was behind center and it was uh, three eighths of an inch. I, you know, I go up to 0 0.1 moderate, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. I mean, that's slight, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 is moderate and anything over 0.2 is kind of, uh, heavy or whatever, and anything over 0.3 is deep, and he was at point, you know, three, three point three five at, at the deepest part. Uh, so that was another factor. Uh, the balance of the soil, I've really, over the years, I've just, um, you know, I, I just, I just feel like a balanced foil is optimum on just about every design. But I look back, you know, you know, uh, 30 years ago, uh, and, uh, you know, boards were definitely thicker in the tail. Um, but his board was very thick in the tail and very thin in the nose, heavy rocker, heavy concave. And I remember the first board he described to me, he, he, um, he, he goes, oh yeah, the, and the rails are kind of boxy too. No way, what we ended up with is a pretty crowned deck. And uh, it had a little bit of ball at the bottom of the rail, but uh, they, weren't box, they weren't boxy or full by any stretch. And then the template, uh, you know, his, um, you know, the front two thirds boards were, you know, pretty normal. Uh, but, the, you know, the back third, um, a little more, Parallel, a little bit, full, a, little, a fair bit fuller tail block, and um, so that board took I don't know three, four, five go arounds. We finally, we finally got him, and he adjusted. He, you know, he, he came down a little bit in the nose rocker, not much in the tail rocker. He, the board's a little bit more balanced. It's not like 0.35 thicker in the tail. It's point one, maybe one five thicker in the tail. And, uh, you know, there's so much that goes into the design of the board that, uh, Josh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, that, you know, the boards might look the same when you go through our design, uh, our, uh, what we have to offer. But really, if you get down to details, they're, they're all significantly different. And, um, I think, jo you know, Josh is a, I, I, Josh, sorry, Josh just hit me. Uh, uh, Wade's board, um, you know, it's, it, it, you're gonna have to kind of ride it in the back of the board, you know, uh, and I get surfers, everybody's interested in the board, and they go, well, I'm a heavy front foot surfer, I was interested in the Wade model, I'm going, you know, not, Wade's not really a heavy front foot surfer. You look at the gashes and the gouges he, uh, <laughs> he does. Uh, and it's pretty apparent that all the powers, uh, most of the powers, like, he, you know, he drives on his front foot on the uh, bottom part, but the power is in his back foot. Um, so yeah, there's, that's, if, you know, we're building a pro model, we, we, you know, Josh Kerr, I've, I've built him some pretty stock boards and he had an interesting experience. He came in one day, he, you know, he called me and said, oh, I just had the best surf ever. And I fucking rode this board, it's insane. And, and, uh, and I said, oh, oh that's cool. You, you bring it down and show it to me? And he goes, yeah, yeah. And he brings it down and it's one of my boards. So I go, when did I make that board? And he goes, oh, a couple of years ago, but I've had it sitting in my garage. Uh, and uh, so, while the pro surfers are pretty dialed in, they, I think uh, 
they could probably open their minds a little bit too. I mean, I had a, a team writer in the early 80s, Mitch Thorson, a uh, West Australia guy. Uh, he's he's a good uh, regular foot uh, power, power surfer. And, uh, he tried a couple boards and he liked them. And then we got into a relationship and when he ordered his next board, he'd, he'd have some changes. And I, I finally got so sick of, and they're pretty small changes, but he always, he, always, he had the butt board, <laughs> butt board uh, syndrome too. So, I, so what I started doing is I started shaving him the board that I thought he needed, but I'd put, I'd write his dimensions on the, on the foam and, and the stringer. <laughs> As soon as I started doing that, I, you know, in a sense, I stopped fighting because I put his dimensions down, but the board was actually my dimensions. We had a great relationship. So uh, it goes to show you that pros don't know it all. Uh, you know, and most boards have rede some redeeming qualities. Some of them have a lot, uh, but uh, Frankie, Frankie's our epoxy. He was our epoxy laminator for what, 15 years? There's a shortage of epoxy glassers. I mean, polyester for that matter, but there's a shortage of laminators out there. If any of you have any basic skills, you might want to check in with the different factories around town because chances are somebody needs a, an epoxy laminator. Uh, let me see. Happy birthday to the apartmenter. I started making Dave boards in uh, 82, I think. Uh, <clears throat> and he went on a tear where I think Hang 10 had a summer series on the West Coast. A six contest. I think he, he won all of them or most of them in 83 on, on this uh, 5, five ten, twenty and a half in the middle uh, by a 15 and a half round tail with a wing I think I had a wing uh, but that was his go to board that, that summer and, and uh, I, I, you know I was always, always very fond of Dave he was very sharp and um, Kind of like Clint Eastwood, I guess. I don't know. But uh, he, um, uh, he, wrote, he wrote my boards for several years. And uh, a couple of years, like 86 or 87, he came back from South Africa uh, with ideas of, um, of a board with a little bit bigger back fin and smaller front fins, which had been worked on in Hawaii by Eric Arakawa and Pat Ross and some of the other forward-thinking shapers, um, but he, I can tell he was ready, to, he, he shaped a few boards by himself, but I think I, at 80, I don't know, 86, 87, he's ready, he was ready to, you know, duck out, and he never really liked the, uh, the media attention, blah, 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 the whole scene, so he, he moves uh, up to, you know, Cay Cayucas, I guess, or San Luis, and started shaping, and he's developed. He's de he's developed into a world class shaper, and he does his own thing. And he doesn't. He just word of mouth, and uh, you know, it's Groundhog Day. I don't need that to remember your birthday, Dave. But happy birthday. <clears throat> is there? Well, the question is: Is there too much difference in flotation? between EPS, torsion spring, and PU. Um, I think the EPS foam is about seven, eight, ten percent lighter than uh, PU, and uh, maybe four percent lighter than the extruded polystyrene, which is our torsion spring, which uh, unfortunately we're uh, the factory shut down where we got the foam, and um, unless we want to do a half million dollar minimum order with Dow Chemicals, and 
they might die. The, they might not die the full blue. <laughs> uh, it looks like, at least temporarily, our torsion spring business will be uh, 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 not over, but on temporary hold, as we're running out of blanks. Um, and I believe that construction is insane. It's different. It's epoxy. You have to glass that foam with epoxy. You've got to put little tiny tiny pinholes in the deck so as the blank as the blank gets hotter and it's out in the sun it expands it gives off gas uh, more so than other foams um, but it's got great flex it's very durable it's waterproof um, the EPS uh, is very water absorbent water travels through it quite easily um, but as I mentioned earlier with the molded high pressure uh, EPS Foam, it's much better. It's much tighter. It's easier to shape because of you know instead of the beads falling off, the beads are now stuck together pretty good. You can sand them pretty good, and uh, it's more a little bit more waterproof. Um, but that's the lightest. In general, in generally speaking, that's the lightest foam, and it's like I said, it's about eight to ten percent lighter than average PU, and um, so. You know, you have the volume, but if you get, if you imagine if you had one board that weighed three pounds and another board that weighed 30 pounds, you had an EPS board that weighed 30 pounds and you had a PU polyester board that weighed three pounds, it's the EPS board will be, uh, you know, it, it, won't, it won't float that good. So it's, it's, um, you know, the volume is one thing, but the weight is another, too, that people need to take into consideration. Uh, but, yeah, we I generally make an EPS board um, 7, 8, 10% less, less volume than, uh, you know, especially if somebody's a, a regular customer and they know what they want. Uh, yes, I build the EPS boards a little bit less volume. Uh... What's your favorite tail shape? Well, I, man, there's all kinds of tails. There's, uh, these days there's, I mean, a lot of people think there's new tail, there's new tails, but I, I, you know, surfing is a thing where the knowledge, especially shaping, the knowledge kind of filters down out of the past and some people forget that, uh, yeah, there was a bat tail you know, I, I had mine in the late 70s, but there was, um, towards the end of the, <laughs> you know, the longboard era, there was a bat tail. I, I think it was based off the Batman <laughs> TV series or movie or whatever. But, um, and there was probably a bat tail in the early 60s. <laughs> um, but, you know, tails, we uh, as shapers we can explain the difference between the tails and there's differences i you know i love the look of a more balanced outline uh where the nose and tail dimensions are closer uh, closer in value to each other i mean we used to uh, three inches difference uh, three inches back was you know, standard wide point position, three inches wider was the, you know, the tail and the nose. But, you know, nowadays I, I run a lot of boards that are an inch wider than the tail or an inch and a half max. Uh, but the tail that I think, it, you know, that's it, the most aesthetically pleasing is um, in, in elliptical tail. Um, uh, you know, that's, I think some people call it a thumb tail, but... You know, it's a little bit different than a round tail, uh, and it's a little bit fuller than a round pin, but it's just so pleasing, the curve is so pleasing to the eye, and the boards, you know, you know, one, especially if you're just a kind of a style, no, style conscious, but you know, a lot of pros use them, uh, and so, yeah, round tail, elliptical tail is my favorite tail shape. Um, can you recommend a solid base three or four board quiver to cover the basic wave range for average surfers? 
Okay. Um, start with small ways. A um, couple ways uh, approach small ways. You can write a shorter, wider, lower rocker board like the Dwart has been a phenomenal success. It was a it was a fit a traditional fish sitting in our outgoing rack waiting to be glassed and somebody knocked it over and broke off one of the swallowtails and Rick Hammond uh, you know saved it he put a double wing ground tail on it and we glassed it and you know at the time it was kind of a weird looking board <laughs> but the first person that tried it like freight and then we loaded it to somebody else he freight and so we decided to make a few more and before before we knew, we had, a, we had a monster on our hands, and uh, uh, it's it's funny because before that, the Piranha was the most popular, and it was designed for small ways, but it worked in bigger ways too because they had a leaner rail uh, uh, than most um, small way boards, and it had three wings to step down the tail with, so it didn't have a big block. I, I don't like big tail blocks, um, but. So yeah, the Piranha was the most popular small wave board and then the Dwart overtook it. So the Dwart would be one good thing for your small wave board. Um, and then you need a, you need a regular hot dog board. Um, you got many to choose from. They all have different writing characteristics, but uh, you know, something like people call it a high performance short board or performance short board. And then a step up for sure, uh, unless you have a desire to surf in bigger days. Uh, you know, a step up, and the proper step up is three, four inches longer. Uh, you know, you start getting six, eight, ten inches longer. It's more like what we call a semi gun, and you start getting into the mid sevens longer. It's pretty much a gun. Uh, most people don't need guns uh, unless you you like big waves and you're chasing them. And you, uh, a semi gun is you know if you have a um, a small wave board, a, a hot dog, a, a board for good days, and a board for a little bit bigger days, uh, that's a three board quiver uh, that that has you pretty covered. Um, <clears throat> I used to travel a lot to Fiji and Indo, and uh, especially especially. <laughs> That's dopey. Uh, when, I, when I used to do my end of trips, I always took. Uh, <laughs> dopey. Dopey. <laughs> A little baby pit bull spazzing out for some reason. But I used to take four boards. I used to take uh, kind of an everyday board. And then I'd take two step ups. They were just a little bit longer because chances are I'd break one because that was the board I wrote the most. And uh, and then I'd take a gun. Uh, you know, for the average person, a, a, a shorter a shorter than your everyday performance board. Your everyday performance board is going to be a crappy way board because that's what the surf's like every day. And um, not every day, but most. And then there's a good wave board when it swells up a little bit and then there's a step up. But um, a fourth board? Oh, you know, I'd, I consider maybe a mid-length board just on smaller, maybe cleaner days where you can cruise. Or if you, you know, even a long board just to mix it up so you have something different to ride than the, the door or whatever your small wave board is. But... Um, uh, yeah, small, small everyday wave board, good wave board to step up. Um, I am, I'm out of time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, you know, for all of you to watch, listen, questions, comments, and uh, uh, I'll see you soon. All right, take care.